POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. To me as a pediatrician, POTS is a fascinating condition that's complex and puzzling that provides me with a great opportunity to learn and the privilege of helping patients and their families get better. POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. To my patients and your patients, it's misery. It's feeling bad pretty much all the time. It's dizziness when upright, it's fatigue, it's losing the best years of life in that, as an adolescent, and it often leads to hopelessness. POTS is pretty miserable. Uh, so we're gonna talk a bit about POTS, and I was excited about this when we were planning it because I'm part of a group in North America, in the US, that's trying to come up with some consensus guidelines about what everybody should do to take care of adolescents with POTS. The paper we've produced has now been accepted for publication, and we're looking forward to it being published as a state-of-the-art article in the journal called Pediatrics. However, it's not consensus, it's not a guideline, it's a state-of-the-art article because there's still a lot more art than science in dealing with adolescents with POTS, so I can't give you any answers today. So instead, we should probably title this My Personal Perspective from North America as a way from get, uh, getting away from the pretext of being able to actually provide guidelines or the thought that I might represent any part of North America. Interestingly, I live in Rochester, Minnesota, which is just north of Toronto, Canada, um, even though we are generally considered to be south of Canada. One thing we did do with our consensus group though, was agree on some definitions. We couldn't agree on diagnosis and we couldn't agree on treatment, but we could agree on definitions, and I think those definitions can be helpful to us. I think we all know what POTS is, but then some days I'm not sure I know what POTS is. So we started with orthostatic intolerance. Orthostatic intolerance, we agreed as a North American group, is the difficulty of standing upright, difficulty of being in an upright posture because of symptoms which get better when we lie down. Chronic orthostatic intolerance means that for at least three months, we feel bad when we're upright and we feel less bad when we're lying down. The symptoms we know about, it's that feeling like you might faint, it's extreme dizziness, it's this brain fog feeling of memory loss like we can't think and concentrate. Sometimes vision gets blurry or goes fuzzy or we see spots. And then the typical dizziness, headache, fatigue, and feeling bad. Sometimes there are physical signs of orthostatic intolerance. People can look pale, they can get sweaty, their heart can beat fast, their blood pressure can change. And on physical exam, we might notice what we saw earlier today, some pictures of the peripheral pooling with bluishness of the distal extremities. Orthostatic intolerance is a description of symptoms of feeling bad when you're up and feeling less bad when you're physically down. POTS, as we North Americans agreed, is a form of chronic orthostatic intolerance. So to say it's POTS, we would think, you need to feel worse upright than when you're down, and it needs to be going on for at least three months, and there need to be symptoms pretty much every day. So it's a symptomatic definition of POTS, coupled with the physical finding of an excessive increase in heart rate after switching from the down to the upright position. Um, and we put in the caveat, you can't be fainting before the heart rate goes up. So we exclude those that have vasovagal syncope, a different form of autonomic dysfunction. If the patient's blood pressure has dropped significantly, the increase in heart rate is probably a healthy physiologic response to a dropping blood pressure rather than being excessive postural tachycardia by itself. So when we're talking about, or when I'm talking about POTS in a teenager, I'm referring to someone who feels worse up than down, that's been going on for months, uh, and they have symptoms pretty much every day, and we can identify an excessive change in heart rate when they go from down uh, to being upright. So that's POTS. How common is POTS? We don't know. I've heard some numbers this morning, and I was glad to hear them, uh, but I'm not sure we know ex the exact incidence and prevalence numbers are. But we do know something about how common fatigue is. How common is fatigue in adolescents? And we think that fatigue is one of the key symptoms of POTS. How common is fatigue in adolescents? Very common. 
Studies in the United States show that nearly a third of early teenagers, early pubertal girls, um, have morning fatigue at least twice a week that makes it hard to do normal activities. A third of American teenage girls, at least, seem to be exceedingly tired. Good studies out of Holland would show that 21% of girls and 7% of boys have had significant life-altering fatigue for more than three months. That's a lot of chronic fatigue, chronic tiredness in Dutch teenagers. A study out of the United Kingdom um, showed that 2%, this was a community-based study about a decade ago, 2% of adolescents were, were debilitated by their fatigue. That's a lot of fatigue. We know people can be tired. The data would say if we just look at fatigue that about a third have bothersome tiredness, um, 7 to 21% have chronic bothersome tiredness, and a full 2% are debilitated with fatigue. Fatigue is common. What about dizziness? How common is dizziness in teenagers? We were doing a study of normal vital signs when we went to some of the secondary schools near where I live, and we had teenagers who were healthy at school, normal kids, lie down and then stand up and stand still. A fourth of them felt dizzy that time when they stood up. Dizziness is pretty much universal. Everybody feels dizzy once in a while. Dizziness is common. Even though less than 1% of teenagers will see a physician for fainting, even fainting is not uncommon. How many of us have ever fainted in our lives? Wow. That's a majority, it looks like, have fainted. Okay, we've predisposed it by talking about pots in this meeting, perhaps. Um, so a majority here have fainted. And how many of you have felt dizzy sometime in the last week? That's pretty close to everybody as well. In teenagers, some of you are still young and teenagers. Um, in teenagers, um, a lot are tired and a lot have dizziness. So how common is POTS actually? I don't know, but I've made up some numbers and I'll share my made up numbers and the logic for them. If we look at studies of chronic fatigue, and we heard some of these studies of chronic fatigue syndrome earlier today, but when people look for autonomic troubles in patients with chronic fatigue, somewhere around half or to two-thirds seem to have autonomic abnormalities. We haven't done huge studies of chronic fatigue or chronic fatigue syndrome to say how many actually have postural tachycardia that's excessive, but if over half of patients with chronic fatigue also have autonomic problems, and if about 2% of teenagers have debilitating fatigue, that's looking at the worst of the tired ones, many of whom I would guess probably have POTS. Playing with those numbers leads me to think that maybe about 1% of adolescents have POTS. Totally made up number, but a logic behind it. Earlier today we saw a number of 0.4%, I believe it was, 0.4% of the whole population is thought to have POTS. While teenagers are a small snippet of the whole population, Teenagers might have more POTS, um, and what are we going to find for what the prevalence is? We don't know, but this is not a rare problem. Poorly understood, often unrecognized as we've been hearing all day, but in fact it's not a rare problem, and perhaps even 1% of people do have POTS during their teenage years. What are the typical presentations? There is this typical phenotype, the typical sort of person who develops POTS as an adolescent. Two-thirds to three-fourths or so are female. This is much less of a female preponderance than we see if you look at your adult patients. As a pediatrician, I'm biased. Um, so it's, I'm told 90-ish percent of adult patients with POTS are female. It's only two-thirds or three-fourths of teenagers that are, but still a female preponderance. It usually happens in patients who were high achievers. These are the students that get good grades, good marks in school. They're involved in extracurricular activities. They're high performers. They're patients like we want to be and we want our own children to be. These are high performers, often female. There's some sort of a racial difference. I only know of one person who has seen one black patient with POTS. Has anybody here seen a black person with POTS? It just went up to four, five, six. Some of you have, fascinating. I've seen two mixed race teenage girls, half black, half something else with POTS. Julian Stewart in New York has seen one black person with POTS. A few of you have seen them. 
Um, but there seems to be some sort of a genetic something. So there's a racial predisposition in non-blacks to get POTS. And about 15% of my patients with POTS have a close relative, usually mother, sister, or aunt, um, that has POTS. So there's something genetic going on that might be predisposing. We've been hearing all day about hypermobility being common in these people. And then POTS usually happens within a year or two of the onset of puberty. Menses for girl, growth spurts for boys. So when I hear that in pregnancy, we don't know why things change. Maybe it's because I'm a guy. I'm ready to blame hormones for lots of things, and that's not necessarily good. But we, there's something about the onset of hormonal changes in teenagers, and there's also something about hormonal stability later in the teenage years that seems temporally, chronologically, to be associated with improvement in POTS systems. POTS then happens in this predisposed person early in adolescence, often after some sort of an illness or injury. Roughly two-thirds of our patients seem to have had some triggering event, getting what I call mononucleosis. I've been hearing it called glandular fever here today, but some sort of a significant illness that lays the person up a bit, or perhaps an injury like a concussion. And following that, the person stays sick, gets unable, unable to tolerate a gravity challenge, and develops POTS. The other third or so of patients have a more gradual onset. Uh, we saw Jane's slides this morning of the person falling off the cliff instead of sliding gently. Um, sometimes there's not a known trigger that happens. And then people do seem to get worse the less active they are, both as the trigger and then later on. Bed rest, we heard of this about a couple of times already today. Bed rest and not taking in enough fluids can combine to make POTS symptoms worse. That's kind of the background of who gets POTS as teenagers and when they get it. But what's a typical presentation? It's a blank slide. I'm not sure there's anything typical about POTS. Everybody should be considered as an individual patient and we should customize everything we do for them. But there are at least a lot of common features that we see in presentations of patients that do have POTS. They're almost all fatigued and they're almost all dizzy. It's usually the dizziness that's the sign of their orthostatic intolerance. So fatigue and dizziness are pretty much always there. We've seen data today, 90 some percent if we lump our patients together and look at them. Pain seems to be seen in about two thirds of the adolescents I and other pediatricians see, two thirds of the POTS patients. Often headache, sometimes abdo often abdominal pain as well. Less commonly backache and joint or limb pain, but pain can be anywhere in the POTS patient. Nausea, hard to say because if we ask, everybody will be nauseated some. As a main presenting complaint, at least half of people with POTS seem to have abdominal discomfort or nausea. I don't know good data about adolescent mental health, anxiety, depression issues with POTS, but it seems like somewhere around 20 or 30 percent of the teenagers I see with POTS do have either anxiety or depression or both. Not always did they have any hint of that before they got POTS, and it seems like they're more likely to have it later on when they've heard too many doctors telling them it's all in their head, then they get discouraged and hopeless and they feel bad. Uh, most of them don't seem to have pre-existing POTS. It often seems to be secondary, and that doesn't surprise me because the same neurotransmitters that control the autonomic nervous system are the neurotransmitters that work for anxiety and depression in the brain. So I would expect to see a lot of overlap. Just because somebody has POTS and anxiety doesn't make it all in their head, um, but it's just a comorbidity, a concurrent thing that's going on related, I think, to neurotransmitters. Almost all patients with POTS have some sort of sleep difficulty. We've looked at sleep disorders and it looks like the rate of sleep disorders is about the same as in the background population. I've seen people with POTS and narcolepsy. Maybe periodic limb movement disorder, restless leg syndrome, is maybe more common in patients with POTS than in the general population. Or maybe it's because the people with POTS are bothered more by their bad sleep and are more likely to get worked up and diagnosed with it. Uh, but disordered sleep is very common in our POTS patients. They're not sleeping well, even if they don't have a primary sleep disorder. What about brain fog? Most patients that I see don't think they can think clearly with their POTS. 
Many of them tell me that they don't have memory very well. Um, they don't have a good short-term memory. They forget things. They can't remember words. They can't talk well. They can't express things well. They just feel cloudy in the head. We've done a fairly good evaluation, as will be published soon, of a whole bunch of our patients with debilitating POTS and chronic pain, the worst of the worst symptomatically, and they all have normal brain function. They perform with normal results for a whole battery of cognitive testing. So I don't know quite how to interpret that. It could be that the brain fog of POTS is a perception of not being able to think well, even though they can think fine. Or it could be that the teenagers with POTS all were above average and would have performed a lot better pre-illness and then their POTS has taken them down to the normal average cognitive function. One way or the other, they feel like they can't think right and that's a big problem and it's a big symptom for them. So POTS is fairly common. POTS happens in teenagers, seems to be the high performing, usually female, often with some sort of a triggering event and then they get the usual constellation of findings. There are concurrent conditions, comorbid conditions that we often see. Hypermobility syndromes, yes, by whatever name we want to put on them. About half of our patients with POTS are iron deficient, using a ferritin level of less than 20 as a key to iron deficiency. They're only rarely anemic, but they're often iron deficient. That's consistent with adult women with chronic fatigue who are also often iron deficient. About a third of our POTS patients have low vitamin D levels, hypovitaminosis D, and our patients come from all over North America, so this is not just the northern Minnesota kind of sunshine issue. Uh, so I don't know if that's related to the POTS much, but we know that low vitamin D levels can make chronic pain more evident, so we tend to look for vitamin D insufficiency and we tend to supplement when people are low. Interestingly, though the mast cells we've talked about, I don't know good numbers. I know one adult POTS doctor with our Mayo system who says, oh, they have it so often I don't test anymore, I just give them all treatment. That doesn't quite help us know how common it is. It seems to me that if we'll do tests for urine metabolites of mast cells, it's probably less than 5%. If we ask patients, it's popular these days, so many think they have a mast cell activation disorder. Uh, we've already heard that flushing might not be for mast cells, it might be other autonomic things. But there's some link when some people have one or the other or both POTS and mast cell disorders. Interestingly, I hardly ever see patients with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder with POTS. If we look at population surveys, about 8% of teenagers should have an attention deficit disorder. It's about 8% prevalence in the teenage population. I've seen about four patients with ADHD out of the last couple thousand POTS patients I've seen. Very low rate of attention deficit disorders. I don't know why, but I suspect there's something about the alteration of brain activating factors with hyperactivity disorders that's contrary to whatever the alterations are in neurotransmitters with POTS. So there's some clue there that we haven't figured out. Our next session's about research and what we need to know. All day, in a way, we've been talking about what we need to, you get all the answers. Uh, anyway, uh, so there's something about ADHD being less common that could be a clue to pathophysiology that we haven't figured out yet. And I've seen enough patients with POTS that I've seen almost every other disease concurrent with POTS just because of the background population risk of having celiac disease and inflammatory bowel disease and autoimmune hepatitis and any other condition. What is the pathophysiology of POTS in teenagers? I don't know. We could look at it as multifactorial, and it certainly is, but it could just as well be that we have all these different phenotypes, different subcategories of POTS patients. Maybe there are different pathophysiologies for each different subtype. There's a lot we don't really know, even though there are some common features. There have been several putative potential causes or mechanisms of POTS for teenagers, pretty much the same as what you all talk about for adults. Autoimmune factors were mentioned just a few paragraphs, a paragraph or two before I came up to the stage here. Um, initially, people were finding the ganglionic acetylcholine receptor antibodies, um, finding that those looked like in adults, they might be more common in people with POTS. Subsequent research showed that the patients with POTS aren't much different than the background population in the incidence of finding those antibodies. Um, and they turn out not to be unusually common, and they're not clearly linked to POTS issues. 
we did write up a case report of one boy who did have those antibodies, terrible POTS with autonomic failure, had a pacemaker in for extreme bradycardia. Um, he had a lot of issues, came to us because he wasn't getting better even after immune therapies elsewhere. And we found, great, you are getting better, you're just really deconditioned. Put him, in, put him on a rigorous reconditioning program, his antibodies were already fading away and he continued to get better without needing any other medication. We wrote that up as a patient who had antibody-related POTS, but by the time I actually saw him after he'd had treatment elsewhere, he had all the symptoms and findings of POTS, but the antibodies were no longer relevant. It kind of points at the multifactorialness as well as the fact that we don't know everything going on. We have presented at a meeting but not published looking at voltage-gated potassium channel antibodies in teenagers with POTS. Um, the, what we have seen is that having the antibodies isn't linked to whether the person has POTS or not, but amongst those with POTS, they had a statistically significant higher heart rate change with postural challenge if they had the antibodies than if they didn't have the antibodies. I don't know if that matters, but it was at least statistically significant. Um, and then we heard in the morning session today about some other antibodies that might be going on with studies in Oklahoma and the States. We heard about the German studies of some of the other adrenergic antibodies that might relate. We thought that we might have discussions today over the lunch hour about whether human papillomavirus vaccine can cause POTS. Um, so we did a recent literature review studying the professional and less than professional literature. And our conclusion is there that I circled in red for you. There is no conclusive evidence supporting a causal relationship between HPV vaccine and POTS. And I can stand by that conclusion based on science that we have so far. But that's not to say there aren't individuals that that triggered something. But since in the United States at least, Almost all 11 and 12 year old girls are getting HPV vaccine and POTS when it happens is gonna happen in 12 or 13 year old girls. Um, I'm expecting we'll see some correlation in time even though it does not look like there's any evidence that it's causative. What might be other causative or mechanistic sorts of ways to get POTS? We've been mentioning deconditioning today. Clearly deconditioning relates. We've looked at um, studies of our patients and based on exercise testing and maximum oxygen uptake, about two thirds of them are deconditioned. Otherwise we could look at it and say, wow, about 32% are not deconditioned when they have POTS. Um, so it's not completely clear, um, but we looked, and this was just a sur survey of a couple of hundred patients with POTS, and deconditioning was present in about two thirds, but it's not just deconditioning. We've seen some of Ben Levine's work presented today. He's done fascinating things with people that are deconditioned and they can get better, but of the teenagers, a significant number, about a third, don't seem to have deconditioning as a primary piece of what's going on with their POTS. We've also looked in more detail at how bodies respond to exercise amongst our teenagers with POTS. Um, Julian Stewart, previously from New York, had looked at body plethysmog that big long word that I can't say in British or American English. Uh, body plethysmography, looking at swelling and size changes related to venous pooling. And he talked about high flow and low flow POTS. We've looked at how the heart relates to an exercise challenge. And it seems that there's a significant subset of POTS patients who have a hyperkinetic, better than average cardiac fitness that's making up for a worse than average peripheral dilatation of the vasculature. So it's not that the heart is the only answer to POTS, certainly if a third of ours are not deconditioned, and some of our patients are even super conditioned in their hearts as they're overcoming their blood flow problems peripherally. So a few papers are mentioned there. Paul Pianosi was the gift of the Mayo Clinic to London. He recently moved to London from where we are, we miss him. And now he's in Italy this weekend instead of being here with us. Uh, but looking some of this exercise. So exercise is relevant in the pathophysiology for some. And there's some pretty exciting things going on that we need to keep figuring out about how the heart is responding and how that might be a clue that we could mobilize into better treatment plans even. People have talked about hyperadrenergic POTS practically in my teenage patients. It doesn't make much difference. Whether we measure catecholamine levels and find them elevated or not doesn't change management or prognosis as far as I've seen, even though in the literature with adults, sometimes it seems to be a bigger deal if they have higher norepinephrine levels either at rest or with a more than fourfold increase. <laughs>
So I don't know quite why kids are getting POTS, but some of them are. Uh, the other piece we've looked at is what about parental factors? Again, this was a study that came looking at patients with chronic pain and POTS that were debilitated, missing a significant amount of school, many of them out of school for more than 30 days in the last year. Um, and one of the factors that related to the increase in symptoms in the teenagers was catastrophizing parents. The parents that always saw the worst possibility. Oh, my poor baby, this is going to be a bad day. How can you go to school today when you feel this bad? Whatever it is, oh, this is getting worse. The catastrophizing, seeing the worst possibility parents were the ones that had the sicker kids. So there is something that goes on where the environment is related. That's obviously not the whole story, but it's multifactorial. So I was supposed to talk about North American guidelines. I was supposed to do this based on our consensus statement. And our whole consensus guideline project turned into an arts review about how we do it. Um, and we did not, as I mentioned, come to a good consensus on how we should diagnose POTS um, or how we should treat it. Even though we pretty much agree on the definitions and what it looks like and we can think we recognize it when we see it. So what about the diagnosis? I think the most important thing is to remember the definition. It's chronic symptoms of orthostatic intolerance associated with an excessive postural tachycardia. Um, the 40 beats per minute in kids is based on a couple of studies. One of these studies was going into the schools that I mentioned to you and looking at what do normal kids in school have for heart rate changes. And that's where we came up with, wow, lots of normal teenagers are up to 40 to 42 beats per minute of a heart rate change using a standing test. The other test was taking healthy teenagers and putting them through the autonomic lab with a full-on tilt table test, and it came up with the same, saying up to 40 beats per minute is a normal result in teenagers. I've yet to see a teenager who has a birthday turning 18, 19, or 20 and suddenly becomes a mature grown-up, and I'm not sure there's anything magical about the exact time change. They ignored this question, as he said, to some degree for the adult statements about POTS. Uh, we know, though, that teenagers have a higher normal heart rate than adult, normal heart rate change with standing than adults do, so we have different criteria for kids. So that's what we think, and we kind of have a consensus. I will admit that one key figure in our consensus group still uses 30 beats per minute in kids, and he gets more patients that way. Um, I'm not sure they all have POTS, but that could be an issue. Um, so we do the tilt table testing, but should we do the tilt, or should we just have them stand? Um, officially, by our consensus, it can be done either way. The same thing came up in a British discussion last year because some people don't have a tilt table available, and has anybody even proven it's better? The definitions and the papers and the adult guidelines are usually based on the standing. We've heard about one Nashville, Tennessee study where they looked in adults. We don't know in teenagers how the standing test would compare to a real tilted test. Um, but we know that we can do tilting. The foot piece there is for a feeling of support, not to support ourselves because we still want them to be strapped on so they're not using their leg muscles to hold themselves up. And I looked just at patients I had seen one day and I had them lie down and then stand up, check their heart rate, and there was a statistically significant somewhat correlation, P.04, between a supine to standing and then a tilting test. Now our consensus group realized we don't have consensus, so we're planning to do a multicenter real study to compare in controlled ways. When we look at the standing test, though, people should be standing long enough to stabilize their autonomic nervous system and blood flow and get through that initial tachycardia that many people have. Somebody mentioned today doing a 30-second stand as a screening test. That would be screening but not diagnosis, as was mentioned earlier, and that's why that person sends them to Nick and he gets them a real diagnosis of is this really POTS or not. Uh, so standing or tilting, um, the data still aren't there to say how good each is, but obviously we're doing both of them in different ways. What do we do about treatment? Our consensus group that turned into a state of the art review group agrees that the non-pharmacologic treatments are more important in recovery than the pharmacologic treatments. Medications are not the answer. These are patients, they're not populations, so they need individualized and personalized care. And care is best done from a team. Not just, I'm the doctor, do this, you're done but a team of people from multiple specialties and multiple directions to help, and supportive follow-up is going to be useful to take people to recovery.
we put together a longer review article a couple years ago uh, reviewing some of this stuff. We've already heard about Nellie today. She joined us in that with a little British perspective. Uh, but what does it take to get people better? And in this review paper, a fair bit of detail about cognitive behavioral therapy and some of the non-pharmacologic methods um, that can be useful. Any of the articles I've mentioned that we were involved with, I'm happy to send copies of by email to anybody that wants, um, or I can send some of our patient education handouts if anybody wants to. So what's our approach to treatment? When I talk to doctors about it, we talk about non-pharmacologic and pharmacologic treatment. When I talk to patients, they say, go to school, exercise. They get much more enthused and they just break it down to what matters. Uh, when I see patients back when they've recovered, I say, so why are you better? And I either get the answer, because I started going to school again, or because I started exercising even when I didn't feel like it. According to patients, going to school and exercising are the keys to recovery from POTS. We divide, so people can remember it, and we think letters are clever, we divide it into the steps, S-T-E-P-S, salt, take in lots of fluids, exercise, prescriptions for most patients but not being the key, and then the et cetera S of school support like cognitive behavioral therapy um, and the rest of life that they need to keep going with. We tell our teenage patients they should have as much salt as their taste buds can tolerate. They should have lots of salt. They should change that habit after they're better so they don't have hypertension as adults. But they should have lots of salt. If we want to get scientific, and I don't bother to do this much anymore, uh, we can look at their 24-hour urine sodium excretion and target more than 170 millimoles per day. But usually we just say lots of salt. I've only had two patients with puffy eyelids in the morning. I congratulated them for having more salt than they needed, and then they backed off a bit. Otherwise, more salt. Fluids, how much fluid should they take in? Two liters, four liters, how many cups, how many glasses? I don't know the exact amount, so we tell them enough so that your urine looks clear like water. That's usually the best reliable factor. If the urine looks yellow, they need to drink more fluid. In the old days, I told patients, drink so many glasses of water, and I got a photo from a patient I sent home to Toronto, Canada, actually, and she sent me this picture of herself saying, how many glasses should I drink? In Canada, they have really big glasses, and I told her eight of those each day would be fine. <laughs> her urine was very clear. Uh, exercise, I think, is the key. If we really get it down, it's going to be exercise and cognitive behavioral therapy, I think, for our teenagers with POTS. We want to get them moving. Our target is going to be 30 minutes a day of cardiac exercise, aerobic exercise, which I define as breathing faster than normal. Some people like to follow a target heart rate. I don't know what to do with that when somebody goes up by 60 beats per minute just by standing up before they're exercising. So I say they should be breathing faster than normal because of the exercise. That's hard too, because some of them hyperventilate when they stand up. Anyway, breathy, breathing faster than normal cardiac exercise. But it's the target of 30 minutes per day. They're gonna have to increase incrementally to get there. Some patients will start at 10 or 15 minutes, some are only able to start at one minute. Um, and whatever they do, we'll talk about. I've heard different words used for the exercise, and which confuses patients sometimes. Some talk about paced exercise, and some talk about graded exercise. By whatever it is, we tell our patients to plan on your exercise and do that every day. It's not how do you feel today, and then you'll decide that. So we start with a doable number of minutes of aerobic exercise, whether it's two or five or however many, and then every five or so days, add a minute or two to that. That'll take them two or three months to get up to their 30 minutes a day of cardiac exercise, but they'll be going by a plan and a pattern, not, well, I was doing fine, then I felt bad, so I took three days off. No, we want them to keep going as part of this retraining the body of what it's supposed to do. Exercise seems to be the key. This is not an advertisement for anything, but at least half of the times I'm seeing kids with their family, somebody in the room has some Nike shoes on, so we talk about the swoosh, and I say, what's their slogan? And they all say, just do it. Ah, there's your answer. Exercise, just do it. Um, they need to get in and do the exercise. Um, so we talk about the exercise is best if it's sustained and it's vigorous and upright. Yes, some people need to start with horizontal exercise, but we try to get them up because we're trying to retrain the autonomic nervous system to get the flow to go up and down. Uh, morning exercise is harder for most, so if they plan on late afternoon, that usually works better practically. Exercise doesn't work if it's only talked about. You have to do it. 
You do not gain 24-hour fitness by taking the escalator up to the gym. You have to take the steps, S-T-E-P-S, um, to get your exercise um, so you're going to get better. Medications, we have no consensus in our consensus group that turned into an art review group um, about how we should do medications. Uh, we have some in the group, like me, that have a nice logical progression of do all the non-pharmacologic stuff, and if you're really bad or you're not better enough, we'll go ahead with medicine, and I have my order I'll tell you about. We have another in our group that says to his patients, tell me your top three symptoms. Okay, I'll give you a medicine or two for each of those. Um, very different approach. I try to have people on as few medicines as possible, but there's not much science to say what we should do behind this. I used to try to be really logical. I still try to be logical. Um, in the, one of my former attempts at logic, I would find out about their symptoms and look at their blood pressure and their heart rate at rest, and I would decide whether to use a beta blocker. My habit happens to be metoprolol. But I'd decide whether to use a beta blocker or to use mitodrine. And then we surveyed some of our patients a few years later and said, how are you doing by this survey? And everybody that was taking a beta blocker said the beta blocker was helping. Two-thirds that were taking the mitodrin said the medicine was useful to them. So I learned from my patients. So my habit now with medicines is I use a beta blocker. For me, it's going backwards. Uh, for me, it's usually metoprolol. And then sometimes if that doesn't work, I can add something or switch to mitodrin using it at the doses there. Uh, a third of my, looked back, 30% of the patients that come to me with POTS think they have asthma. That's more than twice the prevalence in the normal population. I think what it means is lots of patients with POTS sometimes feel like they can't catch their breath and somebody told them it was asthma. I rarely see problems with beta blockers in my POTS patients. Those that have known asthma and it's real asthma still usually can do okay on a beta blocker, but they need to be warned if your asthma is getting worse, take care of your asthma. We might not be able to continue it. But I don't personally use asthma as a contraindication to using a beta blocker as long as we have good follow-up. Um, so a beta blocker first, mitodrine is the next choice, and then a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, especially for those that aren't better. I think the SSRIs help tighten the vasculature a little bit, and they certainly seem to help with some of the abdominal pain that seems to be from potsiness of the gut and with some enteric autonomic abnormalities. I'll use citalopram some for that. So that's kind of the medication progression I go for. I did not put fludrocortisone on my list. Most pediatric POTS doctors start with fludrocortisone, um, so I won't say that's wrong. We put it in our review articles as a possibility, um, but I figure if you drink enough salt and, well, no, if you drink enough water and eat enough salt, that's doing the job of fludrocortisone. You don't have the hypokalemia risks. And if I'm on, putting the patient on fewer pills, I'm demedicalizing a bit, and I don't want them to keep thinking more pills is what's always going to cure you. So I don't personally use much fludrocortisone. I'm assuming most of you probably do. Most pediatric people do. But I haven't found not using it to be a problem if people will be using the fluids and salt. I'll tell my patients that medications are like the gas in the gas tank. Um, and some of the other things we do, fluids and salt, are like the steering wheel of the car. But unless the car is moving, it doesn't matter what's in the gas tank and what the steering wheel says. To get a new direction toward recovery, you need to get moving. That's why I say exercise. Exercise is the moving. The gas tank and the fluids and the salt and all that, those are minor compared to the exercise. At least that's the explanation I use. Anyway, fludrocortisone is certainly used by many. I've seen patients on almost everything else we mentioned today and a few other things. I don't use them very often. I think that I is an, I have many problems as an American, but I as an American am behind you Europeans and British people who've been using Ivabradine for a while. I just prescribed it last week for the first time. We do have it available in the States now. I haven't just yet seen personally how that's going to impact my medication choice. You all have more experience than that than us newcomers to Ivabradine do in the States. Anyway, there are lots of options. That's kind of what I do. Um, it would be nice if we had more consensus. Then I have to remind myself to take care of everything else. Most teenagers' lives are out of balance anyway. Their pots will get better if we make sure they're getting enough sleep and having regular meals and managing their stress. Uh, whether they have sleep disorders or medication, needing depression, or anything else we will. And as I mentioned, we're often giving iron and vitamin D to the half and third of patients that are deficient on either of those. So we need the holistic care to take care of everything else.
Uh, we summarized this in a review article now several years ago that still works with, you don't have to read these details, I can send copies if anybody wants, non-pharmacologic stuff at the top. And we did put compression stockings, hosiery as we just heard, support stockings there. I've had a couple teenagers that'll wear them. Um, and if they wear them, I think they would help. Most teenagers don't like the feel or the grandmother look of them, they tell me. But athletes are using more tight pants and compression garments now in the States, and I think it'll become more used, more socially acceptable. And then we have the whole slew of medications that we might use from first line, uh, wherever we put the mineralocorticoid fludrocortisone to the rarely used other sorts of things. There are some treatment options we have. STEPS, that was the P prescription stuff when we need it. Our patients need to make sure they're getting enough sleep. They need to get to school. If they're not in activities of a normal teenager, they're not gonna recover very well. We push school, we give them good projects and good ways to get there. We work with schools and school nurses to help make it happen when we can. And then we make sure they've got a good supportive family, a family that supports them in their movement toward recovery. My bias is that all teenagers with POTS can fully recover. I like my bias and I still believe that. Um, all teenagers with POTS can fully recover, so we need to be supporting recovery, not supporting you feel so bad, take this year off of your life. Um, so we need to be moving toward recovery. Cognitive behavioral therapy works. There are good ideas about that. A quote with, uh, from a patient that said, hanging out with my friends make me feel like things are getting back to normal. It's worth it. Not easy but worth it. Um, patients can get better. So what are the outcomes? Uh, we know, oh, sorry, that's not outcomes yet. I'm looking at the wrong place. Uh, what about pain with POTS? Most of our patients have some pain. Some are debilitated by pain. There are good data that say cognitive behavior therapy works. As I mentioned, exercising when you feel like it does not work as much as planned exercise, whether we call that pacing or grading or whatever for the not being re rigorous about it. We have a three-week pain rehabilitation center that's really pots and pain. Chronic symptoms can get better. Almost everybody, 90-ish percent of patients, even if they've been out of school for months or years, going through our three-week recovery program can go back to school full-time and stay in school right after the program. This rehabilitation program is cognitive behavioral therapy based with lots of occupational and physical therapy, um, and it helps them, and we have good data showing that by the end of the three weeks and sustained three months later, they have less anxiety, less depression, less functional disability, less dizziness, and less nausea. That's pretty remarkable that a three-week recovery program can get people turned around and back into life, and there are data not quite in print, but uh, in press um, being published that go through our first thousand patients going through the three-week pain rehabilitation program. So what are the outcomes? I told you that I'm biased because I think patients as teenagers with POTS should be able to get better. Most teens do outgrow their POTS. Well, their outgrow means they do get bigger or they just get better over time and they can get back to normal health. Uh, another patient, quote, when I decided I was going to fight my symptoms, I was scared. My first day felt like boot camp, but my mom and dad helped me to stick to it. Today my life is better than it used to be. Recovery happening, even though it's hard, uncomfortable work, with a family supporting the patient uh, as the patient moves toward recovery. Uh, what are the actual data about recovery? Looking a few years ago at a mixed group of adolescents and adults from our center, 34% of them did not qualify for a diagnosis of POTS one year later. A third of our patients, one year after starting treatment, this was adults and adolescents, 34% no longer had excessive postural tachycardia. I think that's pretty phenomenal, a fairly quick, tangible, demonstrated recovery from POTS, uh, but that's not just teenagers there. Uh, we looked back, the study I mentioned where we just surveyed our patients, uh, two to five years after we had seen them, we only have data on those that answered the survey, not a perfect study, uh, but of those, I already told you, 100% said they were improved with a beta blocker, 62% improved with mitodrine. Those patients were feeling and functioning a lot better. And then within the last year, we published a paper um, looking at outcomes of POTS um, in adolescents and as we found, this was another survey paper uh, where we surveyed patients. We only know from those that answered the survey, but the average was about five and a half years since diagnosis and starting treatment with us, surveying about five years later. Um, on average, 
86% of adolescents with POTS reported resolved, improved, or now only intermittent symptoms. There was a problem with this study because we included the question, do you ever have dizziness? Well, sure, everybody has some dizziness. Um, so it looks like they didn't all recover. But recovery doesn't mean you're never dizzy. It means you're functioning and you're doing well. And this is, by that survey, 86%. That's not bad of people that are getting better, and some of those had other comorbidities, and it could be the comorbidities that are actually what's keeping them down. So a patient story again, uh, we'll call her Emily. Um, this was what they sent to us shortly after visiting us with POTS. Um, the mother wrote saying, I'm just stunned at the difference in Emily since we returned from Mayo's. She's exercising daily without prompting, following her regimen exactly, and is back to work and out and going places every day. The mother said, I could go on and on. It's just amazing and such a joy. If there's one thing I could pin it on, I believe that our trip to Mayo gave Emily back hope. Mother put hope in all capitals. Short-term outcome was phenomenally great. Typical, but phenomenally great. And the mother didn't say, you're such a good doctor. Your medicines are so good. Thanks for telling me to eat salt. The mother said, you gave us hope. What would be a longer-term outcome? Uh, seven years ago, I saw a teenager with POTS, um, told her what to do. She went off and did it, didn't see her back, but I heard from her recently when she was applying to medical school with us. She's now a totally healthy first-year medical student dedicating her life to helping other people that have POTS so they can get better like she did. Short-term and long-term outcomes anecdotally are great. We have a great anecdote sitting here today, somebody that's fully recovered from POTS and now going into POTS more full-time. Anyway, for teenagers with POTS, um, short and long-term outcomes can be very good. To close, I want to say one thing just about my approach. I like to separate, we talked about lumpers and splitters earlier today. I'm a lumper with just big splits. I separate health problems into structural and functional problems. There are problems of anatomy and tissues and testable things, and then there are problems where the pieces of the body are okay, but the body's not communicating, networking, functioning. So I'll tell my patients, some people have functional problems and some have structural problems. Just because all the test results were normal doesn't mean there's nothing wrong with a patient. It just means their body structures are okay. But they still have a real physical problem that happens to be what I would call a functional problem. Teenagers aren't into me saying structural or functional. Their parents understand it when I say it's hardware or software. The teenagers don't even think about that, so they're into their phone and their app. Uh, but they get the idea, sometimes you can see the thing is broken, and sometimes it's just not working right. Um, so POTS is a functional disorder. Even though we have a heart rate change, we don't really have any biological marker to say this is POTS. POTS, like migraines and other things, is a function disorder. And so if we're going to deal with functional disorders, this is back to the art of medicine, I think there are some approaches we can take um, that can be useful. Uh, we need to validate that they feel bad. Yes, this is terrible. I frequently, within the first five minutes of seeing a new patient, will say, wow, you're messed up. They take that as validation, as I mean it, not as an insult. This is not normal. They are messed up. And then I affirm them, and I say, wow, this is real. How could anybody think this was in your head? This is your body that's not working, right? And then I say, so what are your goals? I share with them in the process of getting better. And I move them from their goal being, I want to figure it out, or I want to feel better, which is usually what they're asking me when they get to the Mayo Clinic. I get them to the point early on of saying, no, I want to recover. I want to function. We're moving from dysfunctional to functional restoration. So we have to share that goal and get the common goal we can work towards. Uh, we need to go beyond figure it out, beyond discovery to recovery, actually trying to get better. And my teenagers were high achieving before. They're very smart now, some of them a lot smarter than me. I need to explain things. We can talk about neuroplasticity. We can talk about the nervous system and how it works and how those pathways that we keep using are the ones that get better, how we can get rid of the pathways we don't want, the chronic pain behavior sorts of pathways, and how we can build the flow through the good pathways. And then we can let the patient know that we've got a plan. These are the next step we're going to take, and we're going to be there together through it. We'll be real. We'll be empathetic. I've asked patients, why did you get better with me and you didn't with that other doctor? And they said, well, he was just telling me stuff. You're real. I said, you mean because I admit it? I don't know what POTS is and what I'm doing about it? Um, something about being real with patients seemed to help. Sometimes humor can go a long way to help. And through all of this, hopefully, we can keep working together as POTS UK, as people around the world, to what 
Will Mayo, one of the founding brothers of the Mayo Clinic, said, he said, heal the sick, advance the science. I think that's kind of the mission statement we've talked about with POTS UK. We're trying to help our patients get better, and we're trying to learn more about it so future patients can do well. And I don't know what time we're going by, and if you want questions now or you want questions later, I'll be here all day. <laughs>